Friday night with Dennis. They are AIAW champions. Playing with them brought out another level of competitiveness. And there is Bislam on the floor right now. It's just the team of destiny. Welcome to BTN Video Recall. We have a basketball timepiece to show you. We go back to 1982, the AIAW National Championship between Texas and Rutgers. And to help us kind of walk through memory lane, we have a couple of the participants in a couple of different ways they participate in this game. The head coach for Rutgers, Teresa Grentz, a women's basketball Hall of Famer and certainly a pioneer in the game and what she did as both a player and as a head coach. And one of her players, a co-captain in Chris Daly, and you might know her as the associate head coach for UConn. 11 national championships, but coach, I know that you say the 11 national championships that you won at UConn, you add this one as a player and you do what to Gina? I, I have way more than he does. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're gonna have a little fun. And the other tidbit that's interesting about this game um, that both of you know and the fans will soon know is, is the fact that this has not been broadcast by the time we were taping this. This has not been shown on television. So a lot of fans will be watching this for the first time. And so as we start warm-ups here, Coach, I just want to set the stage in what fans can expect in watching a game like this. Well, there's no three-point line. Uh, they get up and down uh, very, very quickly. And um, it, was a, it was a very good game. It was a lot of uh, good skill, a lot of fundamentals in this thing. So we see the jump ball here. And what's interesting is there was a jump ball in the first half and a jump ball in the second half. And I'm going to point out number 31 with the long locks in the lane there. That is one Chris Daly. What do you think about when you're, you're watching yourself way back when? I was thinking how short my shorts are. And um, back then, we didn't each have our own uniform every game. We used to fight over the shorts. And if you got to the locker room last, you got the shortest shorts. And so I think I lost that day. I think I must have gotten into the locker room last because those look very short and very tight. So this, you're a senior on this team. How could the senior not get priority about the uniforms? No, that's who we were fighting am among. It was among the seniors that were fighting over the shorts. The, the other guys, they got way after, their, their picks were after ours. But between the twins and uh, Bug and June, uh, we were always battling over who was going to get there first. We're seeing some of the signs. We saw the scores table there. You mentioned that there's no three-point shot. I think when the camera now pans to the other side, you can actually see what looked like kind of a, a shot clock on the floor in the far corner. If you look at the top left of the of the screen there, that's that's a shot clock, isn't it, Coach? That's correct. We played a 30-second shot clock, yes. And then the women's game went away from that. Well, I think the other thing people will notice are the officials are all wearing the two. There's only two and they're wearing skirts. So that's something else I, I think uh, people, I, I almost forgot about it actually until I watched it the first time, but um, I didn't think they were any good in skirts or in pants. So <laughs> I found out. So I thought that they were not that good of, appreciate it, of a good crew. That's certainly uh, one of the, the first things that I noticed were the, the officials' uniforms, the, the players' uniforms, the hairdos, um, the socks all pulled up to the knees. It seemed like that was the style, too, back then. Yeah. That was the style. I like to say that whatever our hair looked like, we were very stylish for that time frame. So we, we, uh, we were setting the tone from a fashion statement. And you know you're never going to live this down. And this is the, actually the first bucket of the game. And you watch the streamers here come down. It was, um, if, correct me if I'm wrong, that's a, a palestra tradition. Yeah, that is a, native. That's a big five uh, palestra tradition that when the home team scored that first bucket, they would throw these streamers out onto the floor. And then the game would have to be stopped and they'd have to clean up the, the, the uh, streamers. And it got to the point where they said they outlawed the streamers. And that was the end of that. But that was a, that was a big Philly thing in, in the palestra. I think those were our college friends and they, they didn't understand the tradition. They just wanted to throw the toilet paper. <laughs> that was like Mary, that was uh, Tony and Dylan and some Mary of and friends that took the, yes, that took the ride down. They were just throwing toilet paper at that point. 
What do you remember about the atmosphere of the Palestra and playing a national championship game in, in an arena that's so historic as that one? Um, well, you know, I remember that it was not being from Philadelphia. It was much more meaningful playing in the Palestra for Teresa and the Twins in June. They, the history that they shared with us, it, it, we, you, unless you experience it, I don't think that we could appreciate it. I, I appreciate it now, but I didn't appreciate it as much then. But we had a lot of fans. You know, back then, even on our home games, we would have a couple thousand people, which was a really good crowd. We had a good following. It was close to New Brunswick. So the atmosphere was, was great. We had a lot of fans from Rutgers come down. So um, it was a, I guess they would call that a quaint atmosphere now with only maybe there were 2,000 people at the game. We identified uh, you already, Chris, as number 31. Some other players to um, identify. Number 10 is Mary Coyle, and number 12 is Patty Coyle, the, the twins that were so important to this team. Number 45 is June Olkowski, who also was a head coach in the Big Ten at Northwestern. And, and coach, you know, when you go into this game, you see the, the two guards kind of working off of each other here. But um, Texas had said they felt like they were going to dominate your backcourt, and that didn't happen in this game. Well, if I were a parent and I, were, I was watching this today, uh, whether I had a son or a daughter, I would call up Mary Coyle Klinger, and I would get my kid in there working with her. In fact, I did that with my own son. I called her up and I said, I want you to teach him how to handle a basketball. Um, Mary, as a point guard, she was the ultimate point guard. Um, she was hassled the entire time. You have to give Texas a lot of credit. They put so much pressure on her, but she always, you know, protected that ball, kept her body between the ball, exactly what you're supposed to do. And she just moved. And that was a big difference because if we hadn't been able to handle that ball and run those offenses, this, we wouldn't be watching this game. What kind of teammates were they, Chris? Oh. <laughs> Go ahead, I want to hear what you're going to say. Well, you know, we had we had lost the year before in a in a really tough you know in a tough game, and I think that set the tone. Um, very competitive. I mean, we were competitive in everything back then. Our preseason conditioning, we had basically male practice players before they were actually allowed in, in women's basketball. Our workout and our preseason conditioning was playing against the guys at Cook Gym. And there'd be no one else that I'd rather have on my team than, than my teammates. It was, you know, the twins, June, uh, Patty Delahanty. We would take on all comers. And that's really, we didn't have conditionings. You know, we didn't do a lot of running. We just played. And uh, I, I, I just can't even imagine being on a team without them. They taught me a lot. They, they made me, I, I was always competitive, but I think playing with them uh, brought out a, another level of competitiveness. It was almost survival of the fittest. You, either com you, you would either compete or you lose. You had to go home. Yep. They played for everything. They played, every, you never just went on the floor. You played for sodas, you played for this, you played for the shorts, you played for always were playing for something. Well, and, and we were competitive, um, and this is, goes to the kind of team we were. We played everything. We dominated the intramural league, you know, everything we played, whether it was soccer, uh, flag football, uh, softball. We even, without Teresa knowing, played indoor floor hockey during the season. Uh, but it was part, you know, and we won. I actually found an article. Uh, we were undefeated in our soccer. Um, so we just had a lot of fun, but we competed at everything. We were together a lot, and I, I think it showed on the floor. Well, you kind of opened up the, the archive here, Chris, and, and show us kind of leaning in, but, but lean back a little bit. Show us the apparel that you're wearing. Well, I flew through, as everyone is probably cleaning up things with the pandemic and being stuck in your house, I found my parents saved the sweater that we got. It's the AIW National Championship Lady Night sweater that I decided to put on. I also found my trophy, kind of like an Oscar. This is what we got when we won. Um, and different articles I found from the, the local, uh, there was one from the Philadelphia Inquirer and then our, our local, um, the Rutgers Targum, the Daily Targum, which was our campus paper. Um, just lots of different. I even found our media guide for that year. So it was kind of perfect. We started in front of Old Queens and we finished there. Um, when we got to ring the bell. Lady Knights break out. Patty, one bounce to Mary. Mary, deep left side, down low Dorner, spins, pumps, it's blocked, ball is loose, and we'll have a whistle and a foul there. 
I have to give Chris a lot of credit because she really ran a kangaroo court. If you didn't do what you were supposed to do, trust me, you weren't going to hear from me. They weren't worried about me at all. They were more concerned about Chris and what was going to happen. She'd put you in timeout or whatever, and it's I'm like, they'd come complaining to me. Jenny Hall one day came to me complaining. Chris put her in timeout. I said, I can't, I have, you're on your own on this one, sweetheart. I can't help you. I was a, a, I was a teaching major, and that was when Time Out first came out, and it's how you remove someone. If they're not behaving, you remove them, and you, you make them think about it, and then you can eventually put them in, which is now very common for uh, parents and whatever. So I learned it in class, and I put it right into play, and Patty Coyle was always in Time Out. It was, goes without saying, her name was first, and then anyone else that did something that you know, probably annoyed me or was something that I didn't think they should do, then they would get in time out. Uh, but it was, you know, is the kind of group where you could be honest with each other. That's the kind of friendship it was. You could be hard on each other. Um, like I remember a play, I think Patty Coyle, who had a tremendous game, turned the ball over one time. And I remember Mary Coyle running up to her and said, what are you doing? You can't turn it over. And I'm like, whoa. Just one time. <laughs> and Patty's like, okay, okay. But we were able to get on each other that way. You know, I, I think Teresa told the story when um, June came in. I guess she subbed for me and I, I gave her a long list of things she should do. And then at one point she was saying how she couldn't buy a basket. And I was like, we know. Could you at least get a rebound? But you're not able to say that unless you're good friends with somebody and, and, and you're on the same page with trying to win a championship. Um, as you're talking, I'm watching uh, the game as well, and, and you got called for uh, one or two fouls here early in this one. It's a national championship, Chris. You can't get into foul trouble. Yeah, well, you know, it's funny. One of our uh, incoming recruits saw it, and she uh, was making a comment, and I had to swear that I wouldn't teach her how to foul, that I would, you know, try to teach her other parts of the game. But I think they were questionable calls, to be honest. I don't think I got I have to go with you on that. I, I truly do. The, the way they called the game back then, if you watch the position of the officials, they're so out of position to call the game, the number one. And um, there were a lot of ticky-tack situations. Today it would be totally different. But but our rule I didn't was, get the benefit of any no, calls. You didn't. I say that. <laughs> no, you didn't. But, but, I, but I will say I, what, I gave as good as I got. I think uh, they – they weren't wasted fouls, all of them. I think they knew they got hit, so that was a, a positive. <laughs> let them score the basket either, right? If, right. if you're going exactly. to fight, exactly. So this was a tight game. Um, you know, you see the score flash up, and Texas at this point has a, a, a two-point advantage. Um, what was maybe the – the biggest challenge um, in trying to defeat a team like Texas and, and to give some people some perspective on this. This was a team that had won 32 straight games. They were top five in, in the country. Um, Coach Grants, how did you kind of approach this challenge with your team? Well, Texas was very, very talented. They started one junior, uh, two sophomores, and two freshmen. They were very, very young. That group would go on for their next three years at Texas. They lost only nine games, and the team after that came in went 34-0 and won the national championship. So there was, that was a strong breed down there at that time. And our rule was do not leave your feet. We, we could not leave our feet because they were going around us. And the other thing was to keep them in front of us because that would have been a, a horse race. They were taking it to the basket. They were running. There was no stopping them. But I think the biggest thing was we were able to box out and we could run the offense. We did not – and I think that was with the guard play that really was underestimated. Well, I think it's a good thing the plan was not to leave our feet because I'm not sure too many of us could have <laughs> jumped that high to really <laughs> – some of the guys, you know, some of the younger guys I think probably could jump a little bit higher, but certainly uh, the senior group, that was probably a good thing that that was part – well, for me personally, it was a really good game plan. <laughs> so I wouldn't have to leave my feet. But um, they were – Tremendously athletic, uh, just a, a really, I'm glad we didn't watch that much film back then because it probably would have been difficult to not be intimidated at some point. But I think that was the beauty of our team. I, I don't think we were intimidated by anybody. Uh, I think we respected everyone, but I don't think we were intimidated. I think 
we had a, a healthy um, sense of, of us being good and, and what we and we knew what we had to do to be good and, and to win as a team. So that was you know the biggest part I think going in. Off the rim, no good. Rebound. Dorner puts it up. Hugs the rim, no good. Goes out of bounds. They will call it Rutgers ball. It was um, an interesting time. We had people in our at Rutgers in our department, Nancy Mitchell and Jan Koontz and Rita K. Thomas, who took the time to explain to us what the AIW was. And without the AIW giving opportunities for women to participate and play at the college level, there would have never been, well, I shouldn't say never, but it took them a long time to, for the NCAA to then support women's basketball at the level that it should be supported. So the AIW gave many, many tons of women's op women opportunities before it became popular. And, you know, in the 70s, when, when it wasn't popular to have to invest money or to, to put women on scholarship. So this allowed, you know, it's part of the, the history of women's basketball. The AIW led into the NCA, which has led into what we've been able to do now and all the opportunities that that girls across the country now have to to play in college. So I, I'm I didn't understand all of it then. You know, when you're in college, you kind of you play where they tell you you play. You, if there's a tournament, this is where you're playing. You go. But you know, having the, um, you know our professors share that with us and understand it. And as I've you know gotten older, I, I truly understand how important the AIW was to the development of women's basketball. That was going to be my next question because the just the interesting historic piece of 1982 is the fact that there were two national champions in women's basketball this year. Rutgers, as you guys had mentioned, the AIAW championship, but also the NCAA had its first championship between La Tech and Cheney State, who, by the way, was coached by the eventual Rutgers head coach, um, C. Vivian Stringer. Coach, why did you decide, you had the choice, whether to play in this tournament, the AIAW, or the NCAA. Why did you choose the AIAW for the final year? Well, the truth is, Lisa, <clears throat> I didn't have, I didn't make that choice. That choice was made for us. And because it was, uh, there was a lot of criticism at that time that we were still in the AIAW and not going to the NCAA. We played Cheney State, we played UCLA, we played Tennessee, uh, and we beat them. The only one we did Louisiana Tech, we beat them all. Um, so for us to be there and when we did win the championship, that was important for us to know that we had stayed true to that and this is what we're going to do. And um, we we played in the AIW and then that was the last year of it. And then it went into the NCAs and where it is today. And, and so many people have the opportunity to do it. I wish the kids today knew, uh, which is the same old, that's all history, what came about because they expect to get on a plane they expect there to be a food for them they expect uh you know their uniforms to be washed and everything done and shoes given to them and the whole thing this wasn't the case and i think because of it it was more of an innocent thing more of a uh a, and I, it was just interesting it was just fun well i know we came um we came to the games. We had these red champion sweats that I thought were just the greatest thing, and I loved those things. And I, uh, it probably took me years before I got rid of it. But we were having shoot around, and we looked up, and te and Texas is coming in, and they have these really nice velour sweats and burnt orange and white. And we we might not have matched. I'm not even sure if we all match at the same time. And we're like looking up and. Um, thinking whoa like th that, those are nice can we have them like <laughs> you want to trade we'll, tra we'll trade you so it, it has you know i think it has come a long way in in terms of what has given um and what kids get an opportunity but i think for us at least at rutgers there was only one championship that year and that was the aiw patty puts the ball on the floor Drives on the right side over to Hall, back for Patty Coyle. Long jumper is good. What were the nerves at this point? We're about seven minutes left in this game, seven and a half. What were the nerves now? It's, it's been a close game all the way through in, in trying to win the national title. When you got to this point, there's a when you watch the whole thing through, there it goes back and forth, and it's, it's like a heavyweight fight, back and forth, back and forth. 
But as it gets down to that six minute, five minute mark, you can see Texas realizes, okay, these kids are in here. They're in here. This team, these guys have come to play. So now it gets intense. You can see that they start to really jack up their intensity. And now it becomes a matter of what are we going to do? And that's where it was so important for the guard play and handling the ball and making the plays. And some of the plays that they made down the end, the saves, there was a pass that June makes underneath to Terry Dorner. There's a pass that Mary saves into Patty Delahanty. I mean, there's a rebound that June, uh, that Chris gets falling out of bounds into the band. I mean, there's just some things that they did that really are above and beyond and they, they deserve the win and it's theirs. And that's what I said that and no one will ever take it from them. It's theirs for the rest of their life. I, I just look at, I remember um, just defensively understand, like having the game plan that Teresa mentioned about trying to keep people in front of us and, and just trying to, you know, box out and, and control the defensive end. Because uh, I think Bill Blinda would always say, you know, defense wins championships. And, and uh, you know, I, I thought the uh, matchup zone gave them problems. And, and I thought we did a great job. I don't even know what the, the rebounding edge was, but I thought every – big rebound we came up with it was 44 uh we we got rebounded them see oh, good even if it's by one it doesn't matter right <laughs> good head coach right there she's got the step the box score right in front of her now um bring your eyes to the screen here you can talk about some really really big plays and we've got one coming up juno kowski's on the elbow take me through it well the thing with this is Terry Mackey and Patty Coyle have literally been at each other the entire game. There's no, I mean, they have, they've had a, a street brawl between the two of them. And June went to throw the ball on a backdoor pass. It was earlier in the game. She tried to hit Jenny Hall with it. But Annette Smith, who was a freshman, had her hand there. So the rule was, if you're going backdoor, go. So Patty literally pushes off Terry Mackey. And, she, and then June gets the ball in the high post. Can't throw it down there because... Uh, Annette Smith's hand there, so she said, okay, flipped it over her head backwards. And that was it. The basket. She just sent the pass over her head to Patty Coyle, and Patty laid it in. Chris, you fouled out with a few minutes left. I know. Well, that's the, that was it. That one. That was terrible. Look at that. My hands are straight up. That's a bad. And look at the way. Yeah, that was bad. <laughs> bad. And I, that was a foul. Yeah, I did not tell. Yes, she, she has to still give her, her two cents in there before she leaves. Still, I'm with you. I'm I had to instruct. Yes, I had to. Because obviously, I couldn't just go, right? I couldn't just leave. So three minutes on the left in the game, as we saw, you're on the bench. Yep. But I'm control. I'm in charge of the bench. I'm, I'm in charge. I always felt like I was in charge of everything. So it was whether it was the bench, the bus, it didn't matter. I had some kind of control. I almost, I have control issues apparently. Um, but I felt like I was in charge. So I think I took care of the bench too. No, you did. We always said Chris would make a great coach someday. And of course, I think we had that one picked. Oh. But there's so many coaches on that floor. Yeah. Yeah. It was, um, it's actually amazing when you think about it. Uh, I'm just so grateful I got to play with, you know, Mary, Patty, June, Bug. Well, I learned so much. Um, I, lear I learned a lot, and I learned a lot of basketball, but I, I learned a lot about competing, and I, I just don't think I – I don't know that I'd get – I would be where I am without that, you know, learning that and, and understanding it um, and, the, and the mental part of it and how hard you have to compete to win. And, um, and we just had a lot of fun. I, there's – just a lot, a lot of fun. Um, we talk about, you know, when we get together, and this is the thing, when we get together, we never talk about this. I didn't know the, any score. I had to look it up. I didn't know the score. Um, we never talk about that. We just talk about the bus rides. You know, we had boom boxes back then. Like, there was one boom box, and you had to kind of play music, and you had to learn to, yeah, we talked, we played backgammon. We didn't have, like, the social media stuff. You didn't have headsets. You so we, that was where all the fun and interaction, a lot of dancing, a lot of board games, um, just a lot of fun stuff that, you know, is little, little things, but that things that stand out and make you, make you laugh when you look back. They had a good time. If we had a bad practice or things weren't going well in practice, they'd look at each other and they would say road trip, road trip. And I thought, where are they going on a road trip? 
But they had their own little things. That when that meant the end of that day, they were going Tommy Sweet Shops to have ice cream. <laughs> Tommy Sweet Shop was in Princeton, so we used to drive to Princeton and pretend we were smart enough to get into Princeton, walk around and have ice cream. <laughs> Complete. Um, actually, the last few seconds of the game, we never have recorded because the person who was recording it actually ran out of tape. But uh, but they were able, speaking of tapes, they were able to find another tape to record this celebration. Pretty you know, that, that feeling. I just saw it. I just hugged Big Bill Blindo. I was, it's funny. Stuff that you remember. Our parents were all there. Um, Teresa, we went to Bookbinders after. And you let us order anything we wanted. That's like unheard of. That was not a, it was a very expensive restaurant and we used to have, we'd be on a very strict budget. Maybe well, McDonald's mostly, but we got to go to this really nice restaurant and order whatever we wanted. Well, we had won the championship and afterwards on the floor, uh, AD had said to me, you know, I guess this means you want rings. And I said, absolutely. And then I, I, I was waiting for somebody to say, okay, well, there's going to be a party. We're going to celebrate because celebration is the morale of the soul. And nothing. Nobody said anything. I said, oh, the hell with this. So we got the car and went. And I said to Carl, I said, how many credit cards do you have in your wallet? Because we were recently married. And I took two full credit cards to be able to pay for that. Wow. That was good. Chris, <laughs> we just saw you cut down the net. Yeah. Yeah, that was a uh, ladder. Um, Coach Grintz will get her turn in a matter of moments here. It was really me, you know, if, if there was anything that I, we, I could have done for June and, and the twins, it would be to, to let them finish their career in Philadelphia. That was just so special, special for them, special for Teresa, because, um, you know, it's full circle. They left Philly and probably heard a lot about it, you know, leaving the big five schools and all that to come to Rutgers and to finish their career there as champions. Um, I'm glad I was able to be a part of that. Yeah, that's Jim's dad right there. Awesome head coach up that ladder. That was fun. I love watching the championships when they always win the championship. My husband wants to turn it off. I always want to watch it because I play it over and again. And we had a chance to do that once. Well, Chris has done it. Did you practice? <laughs> <laughs> practice that net flip? No, no, no. I was kind of instinctive. Yep. But I do. I truly, truly enjoy watching them. I mean, to watch these two now get that trophy and the rest of them come out. It's uh, it's quite a privilege, quite an honor. I was telling them to come out. I was bossing them around there. I was really bossy. I didn't realize how bossy till I'm watching this. Um, but it was a group. You know that that was important because it was a group. It was it was about the the entire team. Well, thank you so much for letting us reminisce with you. I, I Coach, I know that uh, we saw some of the memorabilia that, that Chris brought us. Um, I'm, I understand that you've got a couple of mementos. This is, this must have been the thing back then. Uh, this is a plate from our championship and on the back it has our uh, scores and stuff and the season and then all the names and I've kept it. And then there's a mug and on the back has AIW championship. And um, we played, we opened the Meadowlands that year. And we played UCLA in the Meadowlands. And June scored the first two points in the Meadowlands. And this was the plate of uh, the teams that were in. It must have been the thing, but back in the day. It's funny because I, I like to use that as a trivia question. Like, who, what was the first game at Brendan Byrne Arena? And they'll say, oh, UCLA, the men. And I was like, well, no, we played first. So we actually were the first game mm -hmm. played there. Awesome stuff. Well, again, Teresa Grants, uh, Chris Daly, thank you for helping us walk down memory lane and in a, certainly a very memorable game in a memorable year, the very last AIAW national championship Rutgers women's basketball coming out the champions and that is beautiful